Call the order of the City Council meeting work session for the City of East Grand Forks, Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022. It's now 5 o'clock. Would the City Clerk please call the roll? Mayor Steve Gander? Here. Council President Mark Olson? Here. Council Vice President Tim Rampel? Here. Council Members Clarence Vetter? Here. Dale Holmes? Here. Tim Johnson? Here. Mark Demers? Present. Brian Larson? Here. Does term quorum on number one Grand Rides Bike Share and update and sponsor requests? We have Blue Weber here. I'll hand it over to you right away. If you want to go Perfect. through it. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, so here to talk a little bit about uh, Grand Rides Bike Share, which is a bike share program that uh, has been in Grand Forks since 2019. Uh, one of the casualties of the pandemic was Grand Rides. We were lucky enough that uh, our partners with Altru, UND, and the city of Grand Forks stepped forward and ensured that those bikes stayed here locally. So last year in 2021 was our first full season of the DDA actually running the program. Uh, amazing numbers, we had about 8,500 rides we had about 815 users uh, this year we're really excited we've put GPS on each and every single bike so one of the big things that we feel is going to be a huge addition to the city of East Grand Forks is getting those numbers that data uh, when you look at the 2045 transportation plan when you look at a lot of the things like the downtown uh, multimodal transportation plan uh, some of the data on that said that people are interested in riding bikes more they're looking for more bike infrastructure and so it's really easy to say yes I will ride a bike when there's better bike infrastructure but until you have those numbers of seeing those actual users uh, it's something that is a little tough sell in my opinion and so getting that information for us is what's going to be vital not only for our own organization but also for the infrastructure of both of the cities and how we look forward on that so um, we are taking our fleet from about 35 bikes that we had actually all of last summer uh, to 60 bikes this year with those GPS's instead of them being located uh, hopefully you guys got the packet that we sent out as well uh, there's one image from there that you can see where there's about 14 bikes right outside of Cabela's uh, showing very good bike usage to the downtown area including Cabela's Blue Moose things like that this year we won't be as dependent on those bike docks so we're excited to be able to really activate all of those bikes and get them out and being used a lot more um, and so what we're looking for is uh, to continue to grow those partners who are part of this program so uh, all true has been extremely generous and stepped up in great ways uh, UND student government and UND have both stepped up and then uh, one of our biggest additions is we brought on Blue Cross Blue Shield this year uh, since we want to continue increasing the ridership uh, we don't want to charge people to ride this and so Blue Cross Blue Shield was amazing and this program is going to be free for all users so we will still ask people to enter in card information that creates a hold on those bikes so that way if there is any damage to it those people are still the liable users but really making it so jumping on a bike is 100% free so what we are asking of the city of East Grand Forks is to come on as another partner on this uh, it would be at the $10,000 level so we've had discussions with Reed and basically just looking to see if there is any support we would love to have East Grand Forks as part of this program we have any questions right away Mr. Demers thank you Mr. President just wondering from Nancy is there I know the. I just looked at the schedule it looks like like transit or transportation alternatives like is done now through the 22nd or 22 is there are will there be opportunity to use that any program or write for grants for this within that program or any program within trend tap funds usually um are for construction of like trail and sidewalk projects and or safe routes to school programs typically a non-infrastructure type of a program like this especially at the ten thousand dollar size um, would not qualify for that it's a 50,000 mini minimum usually requires a local match and then um, there's just some other things involved so I don't think this would be a good fit for that grant um, I did visit with Reed and I know he had mentioned to me he wasn't going to be able to attend this um, we do have some of the all true funds that we had received um, to improve the parks and rec program available for this year for the ten thousand dollars and then i um, if we wanted to go into it this year and then see if there was a way that we could find funds elsewhere um, to fund it for years to come because it really is a, a, a 
not only is it good for our transportation, it's good for our transit, it would be a good connection for that, as well as um, I think it is a boost to the city businesses and it kind of shows that we're interested in promoting those businesses and getting anyone who's here visiting, not just on the Grand Forks downtown side, but kind of using our facilities to our pool, our our restaurants, our campground, getting our campground people out and around East Grand Forks as well. So um, Reed and I thought if there was ways that we can maybe um, look at other options um, to come up with that $10,000 other than just the general fund, we can kind of explore it that way. But I do think it's a good program, so. Anything else, Mark? Just what happens to the, the revenue, the rental revenue? Uh, for us directly, uh, so really goes into the operation of the bike share as well as our organization. Um, it's very costly affair, I'll just put it that way, uh, to maintain all these bikes, to do all this update, and the software on it is uh, pretty lofty as well. So really goes into the operation of the bike share itself as well as our organization and putting in that staff time. Anything else, Mark? Is there a way to, let's say we wanted to look at some kind of a grant, Nancy, if we could do a multiple year request on that with the price, with a match from us? If we could look maybe five years where it's going to be that $50,000 or more? I, I can talk to the DOT about it. <coughs> yeah, yeah, no, there's nothing that says that we can't. Um, that would be something that I can visit with them about. Because we have done it with Safe Routes to School. So right. there could be others available as well. I haven't really dug deep into some of the grant applications um, for those types of things. There could be one that's a uh, parks and trail rec uh, program that we haven't looked into yet. So that would be another option. And we can do that. It would just be this year's um, commitment and then we can see where we can go with it for next year. Um, have, I guess my one question for you is, have you contacted Sanford? Because they're... We have not, and that is uh, one of the reasons why we have not is because All True being the title sponsor of this, uh, they are very, very generous with their support of it, but part of our agreement on that was also uh, having an exclusive kind of gotcha. health system sponsor. Gotcha, because, um, you know, they're a more prominent mm -hmm. um, clinic here in the East Grand Forks side. So I was just wondering if that was an option available, so. Mr. No. Gulstead, did you have something? Yeah, thank you. If it's the uh, will of the council to go ahead and invest in this, that'd be one thing, but I don't think it can be just a $10,000 check that goes to the uh, the association. We could figure out a way to structure it based upon to make sure that it's a legal expenditure as opposed to an investment in a nonprofit. So we would have to look at how that money would be structured or set up some type of an agreement, lease, loan, something, or not loan, but something on that line to make sure that we're not falling uh, on the opposite side of the statute. Thanks, sir. Mr. Helms. Thank you, Mr. President. Do we know is there any is there anybody else in the city that is actually in the bike rental business? Um, so our maintenance company is uh, Ski and Bike Shop. Yep. Uh, so one of the other big entities who does bikes, uh, as well as the Wellness Center, we work directly with them as well. Uh, they do bike rentals for students. Uh, the advantage of ours, obviously these aren't mountain bikes, these aren't fat tires, they're very nice beach cruisers. Uh, they're more meant to be used to go out for a nice leisure ride as well as grab groceries. So where we're able to complement with the Wellness Center is basically a little bit more specific bike rentals comes from them. But we do work directly with them to make sure that our bike are free for any users while there's are a rental fee that's what kind of bothers me a little bit as a city I don't know if I'd be willing to go along with the deal of competing against a couple businesses that's trying to survive and and we're, we're uh, putting money in to do something for free when they're trying to make a living at it I'm, I'm um, really 
I'm, uh, I don't so, know if I'm into that. Uh, Ski and Bike Shop is our uh, sole provider of uh, both the maintenance of the bike share program, so they maintain all these bikes and do all the work on them that needs to be done, as well as our rebalancers, where that's uh, a job that if you would have seen me driving around in a red truck last year, this was something I did to try to keep some costs lower. And so working with our local businesses, we don't want to compete. We're a nonprofit who's membership-based, so we want to make sure that our value is going right back to our members to keep sustaining and growing within the community. Yeah, um, I, I would agree this is a great program. Uh, question for Nancy. Uh, are we well set up here in East Grand Forks with public bike racks so that these bikes can, can look orderly and be put away and not just a giant mess out in front of the movie theater? We have purchased a few. Okay. Um, one f uh, in particular here at uh, City Hall, we have two of those. We did get one for the pool area. Um, we have the one that was downtown at Cabela's that is still there. Um, we can purchase other bike racks. Um, I don't, uh, that would be something again that we could use um, those all true funds for the Parks and Rec program at an extremely reasonable cost. Um, and then most of the businesses downtown have their own bike racks. Okay. So, okay, thank um, you. And one option um, that we could look into then too is contacting DNR and seeing if maybe the campground would be willing to um, maybe sponsor um, some of those bikes as well as a, as a bike because it would be a value to uh, the campground itself. So. Anybody else have any comments, questions? Mayor? I know in every major city, this is the sort of thing that really connects various points within that city. Um, if you're visiting and, and you don't have a, a vehicle to get out into the hinterlands and maybe you don't have your own bicycle here, it opens up a lot of neat opportunities. Um, you're seeing more and more rental of motorized scooters and these motorized bicycles and then these cruiser bikes. So this definitely the way that people can come into a community and open up a lot more opportunity for ex exploration, spending money, stuff like that. So I think it is a good program. Thanks. I, uh, like I said, I mean, this was something that was brought up in 2018, pretty heavily pushed by the student body at UND. Uh, we've recently brought on a couple uh, people for our committees from Northland as well to help try to get some insight into how to work with Northland as part of our downtown a lot more. And so that way, uh, downtown forks can continue to grow with all students in mind, not just UND, but both sides of the river. So getting Northland on those bikes is really important for us. Okay, what is your timeline that you would need an answer from us? Because I think we, what we need to do is we need to get with Reed and Nancy and take a look at some of these things and Mr. Galstead just to make sure we're doing things correctly if we mm -hmm. did something. So I think uh, working with Carla too to see if, I know you have a question, Carla, I'll get to you in a second. Um, so I think timeline is, I guess my question is, when do you need to know by um, obviously, uh, we, we want to know by August. Uh, bikes are meant to hit the ground around May. Um, right now, we have the funds to get those bikes up and running. This is really to help make sure that it stays up and running. And so as long as we can have an answer, so that way we know, you know, if East Grand Forks is interested in participating, we want that to obviously be a partnership that continues to grow. So. Sure. <coughs> Curly, do you have something? I just had a question. I know you're looking at the $10,000, but if you look at the population between Grand Forks and East Grand Forks, you know, are you set on that 10000 or could we give you a different amount? I'm just looking at dollars and cents and, you know, the population percentage and stuff. So just a discussion on that, that's all. Yeah, um, so uh, the city of East Grand, uh, the city of Grand Forks currently uh, comes in at that 20,000 level. Uh, they're there to support it, not based on their uh, usage population, but more to create that amenity for all the populace. Um, we do have uh, the Convention and Visitors Bureau has come in at a level, uh, as well as that Blue Cross Blue Shield. So it's it's something that we would like to have all of our sponsors kind of uniformly around that 10,000, but we also understand exactly like you're saying, the population differential and so uh, wanting to put the city of East Grand Forks' logo up there, I guess the longest answer I can come up with is uh, we'd be willing to keep having that conversation. We do a lot of work with Nancy and Reed as we want to continue to help build that downtown East Grand Forks world. And so uh, I, I'm always willing to continue that conversation. 
Does anybody else have any questions? I think what we'll do is get our answers from Mr. Gulstead, the attorney, and then work with Reed and Nancy and Carla, and then bring it back to another work session. Sounds perfect. I'll get you back. I'm here anytime you need me. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Uh, move on to number two, consider bid results from 2022 City Project number two, ADA improvements. Mr. Emery. Thank you, Mr. President. So we received quotes for your 2022 ADA improvement project on March 1st. We did receive a total of uh, three quotes. Um, we had sent out um, the quotes to four different potential contractors. Um, so we received, you know, three out of the four contractors, which was good. Uh, so just a summary, we did break it down into two proposals. Um, proposal one is some curb ramps along 14th Street Northwest. Um, and then kind of also, you know, it's like anything else, once you get into the curb and gutter, a little bit of the work, there was some uh, curb and gutter pavement work that only made kind of sense to include as part of the project right at um, the frontage road there too in 14th Street. So that's um, included in proposal one costs. And then proposal two is along 2nd Avenue Northeast, um, kind of right adjacent to Riverside Christian School there. Um, we have a total of about 12 curb ramps and stuff there that need to be upgraded. So um, that was proposal number two. So when you look at the bids, um, you know, the overall numbers were about 8% above, you know, what I was estimating, kind of based off uh, looking at even like last year's prices we'd received. Um, so, you know, construction costs are up a little bit, no doubt. Um, but, you know, when you look across the board, um, you know, when you look at proposals one and two, I guess, together, um, you know, the low bid, is about $175,511, where the second and third, you know, bids are about $195,000, $196,000. So, you know, there is a, uh, the low bid is about $20,000, you know, lower than the second and third bid. So, again, I, you know, I do feel that we, you know, received um, a good quote. Um, you know, we also, you know, with Op Construction, Op does a lot of work in town, does good work. Um, so, you know, very confident in, you know, their ability. Um, so project funding for this project, you know, we have used in the past, and, and talking to Carla, that's what we would use on this one, is we'd use basically our state aid maintenance funds. Um, so with that, you know, unless you have any specific questions, um, you know, my recommendation, um, you know, would be to award it to Op Construction uh, proposals one and two, in the amount of one hundred seventy-five thousand five eleven and ninety cents. So, any questions for Steve, Mr. Demers? Oh, I'd say good job staying with our scheduled <coughs> improvements toward full ADA compliance in our city. Feels pretty good to see it happening, you know, one street at a time. And um, in good faith, we're making progress toward the whole complete plan that we have. And um, I think on a year like this, where costs are a little high, this isn't a big, big project, but that annual progress, I think, is important. Yeah, no, and, and thank you for the kind of the reminder, too, for even the council. As you're correct, the, you know, the city does have an ADA transition plan. And it is something that we have to basically show that we are kind of making progress on that. So we've kind of, you know, between Nancy and Carla, we've kind of committed to try to do something, at least on an annual basis, to, you know, show that we're making that progress. So thanks. Mr. Demers. Thank you, Mr. President. Were these quotes or bids? Because you used the they were for the words. They were quotes. Again, being my estimated cost was under that 175000 You know, we could go out for quotes. Um, you know, it did come in just, just over, but I, I think, unless Mr. Gosta would tell me otherwise, I think we're still, we're still fine. Thank you. Larson. Thank you. Um, Steve, any concerns that um, the low bidder is bidding the right spec on crosswalk markings? They're significantly lower than the other two. I think probably the biggest thing is there, like Op Construction has their own striping 
um, division, so they're able to do that work on their own versus um, like an H and S or Tony Anderson, they would have to sub that work out. But they're they're way up on the uh, <coughs> six inch concrete sidewalk. <laughs> And Jason has Thank used you. op construction for a lot of the striping around town, kind of on an annual basis too, so. so. Anybody else have anything from Mr. Embry? See none, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, consider Hawk pedestrian signal system at Bigland Road and 13th, Mr. Emery. Thank you again, Mr. President. Um, I think as everyone's aware, you know, we had applied through the Safe Road to School grant program, we'd applied for, you know, looking at putting in a um, Hawk crosswalk system at Biglin and 13th Street. Um, we just found out here a week or two ago that we were not, unfortunately, we were not successful in, uh, you know, being awarded that grant. Um, but there was, you know, some interest. I heard from some council members that were still interested in potentially you know, trying to move forward with that project. Um, so in my discussions with MnDOT, um, you know, being last spring, we uh, kind of between us and Alliant Engineering, we had completed that uh, kind of signal warrant analysis. Um, being we did meet a warrant uh, for school crossing, MnDOT has said that they would allow the city to, you know, utilize your state aid allocation dollars um, for this project if, if you would like. So with that, I kind of put together, um, you know, what our estimated construction costs were, um, you know, what it would basically take because we'd have to put together a full bid package that would have to be um, approved <coughs> by MnDOT. Um, so basically, yeah, we'd be able to use our state aid allocation dollars. Um, we did look at that um, with CARLA, you know, knowing too that we have our federal project coming up in 2023, they'll be utilizing some of these funds also. But, um, you know, looking at where we're at right now with the balance, you know, even with our federal project, this project, um, our fund balance still really looks good. So um, probably the only, <laughs> about, Ten minutes before I uh, came to the meeting, I had talked to our district state aid engineer just to confirm if, you know, with if we were to do this system, would we need to complete a full, they call it an intersection control evaluation study, um, which he contacted me about ten minutes before I was going to come over here, and he said we did not need to do that. The only thing, and I'm just going to do some more checking, I just didn't have time, of course, but the only thing he made is he said that for whatever reason, MnDOT does not like the Hawk system, is what he told me. So just putting that caveat out there that I'm gonna have to do a little more checking on where that's exactly coming from. But basically with the Hawk system, um, I kind of gave you guys kind of just some a handout, but you know, the flashing beacon system that we have out there right now, you know, once it's activated, you get the LEDs that are flashing to warn the traffic because there's pedestrians in the crosswalk it does not require the motorist to stop that's one thing with the hawk system it kind of acts almost like a stoplight is once that system is um, activated you know you can kind of see here you basically get to your red lights um, which essentially stops the traffic so you know it can be a, a safer system hopefully but um, again I just based on that comment I got I, I want to do a little more follow-up on that too and hopefully I can get some information and even next week at council meeting I kind of give you an update too but so again like I said I don't have any specific recommendation at this time just wanted to bring the information forward to you guys and see where you want to take it mr. Murphy well, I just want to remind uh, um, city engineer uh, um, Emery, that uh, you do have a little bit more time because next week is uh, is the fifth Tuesday of the month. So you thank you. Ready for next week. Do <laughs> we have any questions? Mayor, um, thanks for continuing the the uh, work for this. I um, <clears throat> was very sad to see that we did not get that funding. I misunderstood earlier. I thought we had a really good shot, like kind of an approval sort of thing. That's okay. I mean, that's the way these things go. 
And so to go right back, turn around and uh, find another funding source and then going through the steps you are with MnDOT, I really appreciate that. Um, I would like to see this in place when the kids go back to school this fall, if there's any possible way to do it. I know that's a tight timeline, but I would like very much to see that if it could, if it could come around in that kind of a timeline. Yeah, and it, it very aggressive schedule. Um, and again, just especially not knowing time frames just for getting materials nowadays. But um, you know, I guess all we can do is, is shoot for that. But yeah, it's better. Thank you. I'd be interested if the MinDOT doesn't like the Hawk system. I'd be interested in what system they do like. What's what? I'd be interested in what system MinDOT does like if right. they don't like the Hawk. So yeah. I'd be looking forward to I, that information. Yeah. I do know they like the flashing beacon system, I think, which we have out there right now. But I'm, like I said, I'm going to do some more checking with MnDOT and see exactly where this is coming from. So, I know they've really caught on. Um, when I go out to Boise, Idaho, there are several of them on, on common pedestrian crossings. Grand Forks has a couple in place. They of got these. some on UND. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, they really do work. I mean, it's, it's, you can't, there's no mistake, it's a red light. You will stop, and the pedestrians will get safely across. It's, it's a good system, what I see. Mind you, that's not Minnesota. Correct. <laughs> it's better than doing nothing. Yep. Anybody else have anything for Mr. Emery? I think bring the stuff back to us after you find everything out. Yep. We'll go from there. Thank you. Uh, number four, consider a forestry cooperative fire protection agreement, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Chief Bushy. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the East Grand Forks Fire Department's been involved in this agreement for years. It's very beneficial to our community in several ways. I was contacted by the DNR supervisor and asked to update it and sign it and renew it. So that's what I'm asking your authorization to do. Anybody have any questions for the chief? See you done, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Move on to number five, First Children's Finance. Carla and Mr. Gordy. <clears throat> Carla and I wanted to remind you about a couple of upcoming events um, that are going on in relationship to the uh, child care work that's going on right now. Um, the first of these is going to be a provider's appreciation event, which is by invitation only, and that will be on Monday, April 4th. The mayor has agreed to speak at that meeting. The second one is a town hall where people are invited, the general public is invited with all of their ideas on how to improve child care and make it more affordable. And that will be held on Monday, April 25th. The first meeting, the child, the providers meeting is going to be held at Valley Golf. The second meeting is going to be held at um, the Spud Junior in the Prohibition Room. Um, there will be food provided at both meals. Carla, do you have anything else that you want to add? No, and thank you, Mayor Gander, to mention it last week. But um, I guess the only other thing would be is if there's any providers that haven't gotten notice to please contact us, and we will make sure you get invited. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Carla. Thank you. Anybody else have anything? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, move on to number six, discussion neighborhood bridge consultant, Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Council President. Um, again, as, as everybody is aware, you know, this project is um, you know, finally making some ground. We're moving forward. We, um, you know, there may be some debate to it, but we have a, a, a location identified. Um, and we, and the, and the, at least on the East Grand Fork side, have taken some several steps for that particular site and for moving forward with this. So um, in all the discussion that we have had in the past, um, one of the things that would really help with us getting funding um, through either you know through the feds through the state um, discussions we've had with uh, our um, United States House representatives and um, our local representatives is that if we would get this project as close to shovel ready as possible that would definitely help with that um, it would move our project ahead of others for funding um, so with that being said um, 
this is a very large and very complex process. There's a lot of things that are involved in getting a project like this shovel ready, but when you're going across a river and you're going from one state to another state, um, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces to it and a lot of things that can be missed. So with that being said, I've had several discussions with my counterpart across the river in Grand Forks. And um, like I said in, in my report is the last bridge constructed between these two cities was in 1963. So unfortunately there is no institutional knowledge and nobody left working at either city that was um, involved in any of these projects um, for that bridge. And so we don't really have any, I guess we call expertise on staff on either side for this. So with that being said, um, we looked at um, seeing if we can get a consultant, the idea of bringing a consultant in that would be able to help, that would guide us through this process. Maybe not necessarily so much of a, not so much doing, hiring somebody to do the, the environmental study, the archaeological study, those types of things. What we'd be more interested in this part of it would be um, the guiding us through the process to make sure that we don't forget a step, you know, that we don't not do a study that would be uh, required. And more importantly, to for the coordination of the timing of what we'd be doing so that there's certain things that could be done consecutively or concurrently or consecutively that we, so that we get this project um, shovel ready in the, with the greatest speed possible that, that we could. So with that being said, um, I spoke, reached, reached out to several other cities. I spoke to the League of Minnesota Cities, um, and I also spoke to um, Jim Strauman, who is the construction attorney that uh, the League of Minnesota Cities uses for if, if any cities have any construction-related legal work that needs to be done. He is kind of recognized as the municipal construction um, expert in there. Uh, so I looked for recommendations for um, firms that could handle this type of work for us. So there was a number of firms uh, that, that kept coming up. Of those, um, the ones that were brought forward were SRF, KLJ, and I believe we have a representative that happens to be from the area that heard about this and decided to come in and uh, check this out. Uh, Bolton and Mank, um, and I didn't read this, Sartec, I believe is the, is the name of the fourth, Stantec, sorry, Stantec, I forgot. And um, and I believe our in our local engineering firm as well has indicated um, um, a desire to to uh, compete in this. So I guess with that being said, um, what I would suggest uh, that we do as a city is that we would do targeted um, um, requests for proposals. We wouldn't necessarily put it out for any and all um, entities to to um, submit. Um, I think we would go after the ones that would that have been identified as ones that are experts and um, experts in this particular field. The ones that were identified there, we, we, would, it, we would send them uh, requests um, asking them to put together a proposal for what they could do for us and how they would handle leading us through this um, through this process. So again, with speaking with Mr. Phelan across the river, um, he indicated that um, they are interested in participating in this, um, however, not necessarily being the lead on it. So with that being said, he said once we would, uh, the council gives me the authorization to go ahead and, and get some of these proposals, he will bring it to his council to let them be aware of it that we are going out for proposals and then at the future, at a future meeting, he will request that they participate in in the cost share for it as well. So we wouldn't be bearing we wouldn't be uh, bearing the burden of the entire cost for the for this consultant. So um, I guess with that, that is what I'm looking at. I will take any questions, and I guess what I'm looking for tonight is just uh, uh, give me direction to obtain uh, proposals for consultants uh, to guide the city through this process. So basically, one of my questions is that since it's going to be on two sides two different states, two different cities. Um, do we want to make sure that when we're asking for these proposals back that they are well versed in both sides? Yes. In counties and <clears throat> so, cause it's, you're going to be totally, probably be two different processes going hand in hand, of course, but I just want to make sure that the people that are going to be looking at this and guiding us are going to be able to tell both sides of the river at the same time, you guys need to meet these deadlines. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, as far the ones that have been re recommended to me, all of them have offices on both sides of the river. Mr. Demers. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so does that mean that Mr. Fiedlin at, at least has signed off on us drafting the RFP 
Yes. Or do they want any? Do they want it oversight before we send it out, or are we? We're at. No, he didn't request will. it. He, he didn't request it. I, I, obviously, I would make him aware of it. I would give him a copy of it, see if he had any any comments on it. But no, he did not request okay. that. And then no. I guess just wondering what do we would we end up doing some sort of a review committee, and would that include people from Grand Forks as well, or? I will certainly offer that to them, but at this point, they haven't indicated that they would be. Um, I just think they, they, at, yeah. at some point, dollars are going to be involved, right? And yeah. at some point, if if they came up with stuff well, and, and I wanted think, us to pay, yeah. I would. And I think I'll get more response from them once, once I because he said once uh, I get the authorization from the council to do this, then he would be bringing it to his council to make them aware of it, and then he'll get any feedback from them as well as far as what probably how they would handle okay. it, but. Thank you. Mayor? Um, I can't remember who all was in on the Zoom meeting when we met with, I think it was the deputy director of MnDOT and two or three of their key staff people. And as we were talking to them about this project, it became pretty clear that the sequence of steps is very specific. And now, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you done this? Have you done that? And about half of what they said sounded familiar, and about half of what they said is stuff that I know staff will have to manage, whoever that staff might be. And um, and so I think to you could call it a maze or you could call it a minefield to try to navigate through there to get to that point of shovel ready. But, but there are very specific steps, and like you said, David, some of them can probably run in parallel to save time, but some of them are going to have to be sequential, mm -hmm. that you have to wait for the completion of this for the start of that. And so to compress that timeline and, and whatnot, I think the consultant will be worth their weight in gold. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Mr. Better, Mr. Powers or Mr. Better? What is everyone goes first? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have been in several meetings uh, regarding the proposed bridge and uh, last week, I was kind of concerned. We uh, had a little visit uh, via Zoom with the uh, North Dakota DOT. And uh, I may be wrong on this, Clarence, correct me if I am, but their idea of a bridge is not on their scope at all. This is not a local bridge. It's not a state bridge. It's not a county bridge. It just doesn't exist. And it concerned me that they're not even thinking about it at all. And the other thing that has come up repeatedly in MPO and especially on chamber meetings, uh, Barry Wilfart is always asking for a spokesperson from the city of East Grand Forks. And uh, I would like the council to consider designating Mr. Vetter as that spokesperson. So if we do get into conversations like David and the mayor alluded to, he would be the person to be contacted for disseminating information. Um, I'm getting a little frustrated because we've been talking about this for quite a while. And it really concerned me that North Dakota, even on their county level, they don't seem to see the importance that we do. Um, you and I have talked about this, and I, I think Clarence would be beneficial. He's a council member. He's been on top of it since day one, and I, I think that'd be a good move. Thank you. I think one of the things you have to remember, too, is that this is why we're keeping going in front of them, keep pushing at them, keep uh, talking to them. It's not because we don't want to talk about because something's going to be hard to do, and it's not in front of them. That's why we're doing this. Um, and if we don't keep talking to them and keep pushing for it and keep asking for it, nothing's ever going to happen. So I'm having out there that, you know, maybe they don't personally know anything about it, but there's people out there that have we've been talked to about it. So... I think talking negatively about it and putting it out there that this is not even on their radar is wrong because it's not, it's, it's been talked about. So, Mr. Vetter. Thank you, Mr. President. And MPO, we had, as Mr. Power said, we had 
North Dakota DOT, Minnesota DOT. We had a federal representative there. The, the take that I got from North Dakota DOT was that it's a local bridge, so the start has to come from the local area. And once they approached North Dakota DOT with this is the local bridge that we want, North Dakota DOT will jump on the bandwagon and, and, and start the process. But it has to come from local. Um, listening to our federal partner at the meeting, uh, she rattled off this program, that program, and there was five, six, seven different programs that we could tap money into. Um, and no one on the council for sure doesn't have the expertise to know all those different programs. So again, hiring this consultant to be able to walk us through all that process, uh, maybe even getting a grant to do some of the planning process, which the federal representative alluded to. Uh, I think it's going to be money and time well spent on our part. I just don't want this thing to drag out. Um, if we can get the RFP out quickly, get the, re uh, the consultant on board within the next month or so, so we can really hit the this summer running and maybe even get some of the NEPA study started this summer, uh, that would be my goal and just get this thing moving forward. Thank you. Anybody else have anything? Mr. Helms? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm in favor of the bridge, there's no doubt about it, but as I've said right from the start, I'm not in favor of another wet bridge. It does us absolutely no good. We need a dry bridge. And my big concern uh, that I have is that we're going to focus on one spot for this bridge and we're going to run into a, uh, a big stalemate and then nothing's going to happen for another 30 years. That concerns me that we got to have some open mind and, and maybe work a little bit and get everybody on the same page on where this thing is going to go. Uh, the other thing that bothers me, it seems like as a council, it seems like we're in the business of keeping consultants and engineers in business. I don't know, I, I, I just, I hate the fact that we pay all these people and then get nothing out of it. I mean, I shouldn't say get nothing out of it, but nothing moves forward on it. So we kind of pay these people to do this stuff and then we, again, we get to a stalemate and now we're sitting there and we paid all this money and and now we're at a crossroad again. That That's kind of an issue that has bothered me for, since day one, even before I was on the council. So, uh, but I think we need to keep an open mind on where this thing is going to go and where, you know, and not focus on one spot because if we do, we're going to end up in a, in a dead heat and, and we're not going to see a bridge for another 30 years. So. Yeah, um, I'm in favor of hiring, a, call it a program manager for this overall project here. Uh, but my recommendation would be, as part of this RFQ, uh, we would have the ability, if we're happy with the services that we're receiving up front, we could continue working with this consultant, this engineering company, to oversee the NEPA study right into the design, rather than having this kind of start and stop, herky-jerky process of hiring different consultants. So if we hire the right team up front, having the option to call it a change order or just extend the contract with um, task orders, continue working with one team all the way through. But just sign them up for the initial study. I think that that's, that's a great idea. Thank you. There. Um, just so we're not confused on, on f the floodable bridge scenario, um, to get a neighborhood or intercity bridge that's high and dry, it's impossible. From a cost standpoint, in it, it's impossible. You have to take it over the top of the levee or the flood wall, then you have to bring it down into the neighborhood, which will take several blocks. So the property that you will acquire and, uh, and the disruption that you create in a residential area makes that an impossibility. So from a cost standpoint and, and the disruption of the neighborhood, this bridge that will connect the two cities will not be a high and dry bridge. But we absolutely need a bridge in that location because if you go south to where you can make it high dry, such as Merrifield, it doesn't accomplish our traffic objectives. People won't use it from the south end of one city to the south end of the other city. They'll keep using the point bridge with all those redundant miles built in. And so the objectives that are achieved by the Merrifield Bridge are very different from the objectives achieved by the neighborhood or intercity bridge, and we really need them both. And that's why I know it's a little confusing, like to our legislators when we talk to them and lobby. Which bridge are we talking? It's two bridges. 
the, the, the conversation on bridges can never ever depart from two bridges. If one goes first and the other goes second, then so be it. But the, again, the, the inner city in neighborhood bridge can never be high and dry. Cost-wise, it'll never happen. And I, I love your idea of another high dry bridge. It's gonna be Merrifield. And again, whichever one comes first, no problem. From our inside the city traffic objectives, it's the neighborhood connection. It's, it's right there at about 32nd. And Bill, same thing. So, well, I believe I have my direction. Sounds good. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved by Johnson. Second. Second by Better. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried, means adjourned. I think when it's sunny, you know, it's going to be like gray. I'm going to get kind of that crazy back to that one. Yeah, it is. You don't want to have this right now. I don't know if you have this.